Ah, there are my sound guys awake now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It, it, it's a great day to be inside looking outside because it's the sun shining and everything. And But when you step out that door, it doesn't certainly doesn't feel like May 8th, does it? <laughs> I heard the heat, the heat kick on and I said to my wife, I said, do we usually have the heat on in May? <laughs> and the answer was, when it's this cold, we do. <laughs> it's okay. I, I wasn't. I just was wondering. That's all. I was just wondering. I was just wondering. It's good to be in God's house this morning. Let's open in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful, Lord, just that we have a place that we can gather in Your name and lift You up, Lord. And that place isn't significant. What's significant is the work that Christ did on the cross and in the grave that allows us to come into your presence, that allows us to rest at your feet and listen to your voice, that allows us to sing praise and honor and glory to your name. Lord, that's what we're thankful for. And as we come and worship this morning, help us to put all aside that would hinder us that would hamper us from hearing your word and let that word make an impression upon our hearts that would stay, would be lasting. Lord, that when we leave this place, we would be mindful of your presence in our life. Lord, we come in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Kevin, you're up. And it's, it's Hebrews 10. Uh, We're in the book of Acts, so oh. Kevin's reading from Hebrews. But it is Acts 15. <laughs> Just something that struck me as I was coming up. Um, you, this was the first of the Kendrick Brothers films that I ever saw. I also think it's the first one that they did. And what was the last word that, um, that he said? I just wanted to finish well. Well, two and a half years ago... Um, Eric, you all remember Eric Swanson, he came up to me and he said, I'd like to see if we can get the men's ministry going again. He said, and I, I said, sounds good, why? He says, because I want to make sure that we can finish well. And uh, Eric certainly did. So that just made me remind me of uh, one of our dear brothers who's gone home and who did finish well. All right. Um, Today's first reading is going to be from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Uh, unlike many of the letters, there's no one identified as the author, and frankly, there's no one identified as who the recipients are. It wasn't like Paul writing to his son in Christ, Timothy. So this is a letter written to all believers, assumed basically to be the uh, church in the latter half of the um, first century. So some words of encouragement. Hebrews chapter 10, starting on verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. That since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So ends the first reading. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. We're going to unpack that a little bit, and some of you may wonder, well, why are we in Hebrews when we're in the middle of the book of Acts? But there's some things we have to know. 
in Hebrews 19, it reminds us very similar to what the book 15th chapter of Acts is. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of what you've done. All the good things you did, right? The way you lived your life, right? Everything you said, right? Right? No, because of what? The blood of Jesus. Don't forget that. That's pretty important. We didn't do it. God did it. And He allowed us to claim it so that we could enter His presence. And how are we entering His presence? Like, timid, timid, you know, maybe I shouldn't be here. How's it say? What's it say there? It says boldly. Okay? Do you think if God tells you to go boldly somewhere that He's not going to back you up? Do you not think that He's going to be with you? When you step out on my name and you boldly proclaim the blood of Jesus, that I'm not there with you? We, we think he, he may have forgotten us sometimes. We think sometimes we're on our own, but that's not the case. That's not the case. So, so we, we need to get straight in our heads the way we need to move forward with the gospel. It says, by his death, and, and this is just to support that it was the blood of Christ, by his death Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. Okay, by what Jesus did, we can be in the presence of God. That's the most holy place. That's the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Fully trusting Him with sincere hearts. What does that mean? What does that mean? His agenda, not yours. Sometimes we go before God with unsincere hearts. We're trying to manipulate God into doing what we want Him to do. We're trying to convince Him that my way is a good way. God, just support me. Just encourage me. Just That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Do not let the enemy tell you that you don't belong in God's presence if you are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where the boldness comes from. That's where the authority to rebuke the enemy comes from. The blood of Christ. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. You ever doubt? You ever wonder if God's going to follow through? You ever wonder if God can follow through? You ever wonder if maybe He's, he's forgot about you? Don't. That's what, that's what the writer of Hebrews is reminding us. Why? Because God already did it through the blood of Christ. He's not about to let us flounder. But we have to remain where? In His presence. In His presence. And do we, can we be in His presence? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to act of love and good works and not and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do but encourage each other especially now that the day of his return is drawing near and it's drawing near it was drawing near then and that's a few thousand years ago i think it's drawing we're closer we're closer i don't know when it's going to be but we're closer we're two thousand years closer spending time with each other learning from each other, teaching each other, encouraging each other, lifting each other up are the necessary elements to building the church. That's what the writer of Hebrews is helping us to understand. 
Because what are we studying in the book of Acts? We're building the church. We're building the bride of Christ. We're building the church here on earth. These are the things that we need to be focused on. A body of believers committed to serve God and support each other. Amen? Okay, we're back into the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, um, chapter 15, verses 22 through 35. Here's your finding the place. Um, as just a reminder, uh, Paul and Barnabas had returned from the first missionary journey to their home church in Antioch. There had been some dissension about new Christians who were Gentiles. Do they have to become Jews first? They went to Jerusalem and the matter was answered by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. So now they're returning, and that's where we pick up on verse 22 of the book of Acts, chapter 15. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from among us, troubled you with words and unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep them keep yourselves from these, you'll do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch. Having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. So I hope you've been with me for the last two weeks and now three weeks. We're going to... We're trying to unpack this. Now, we talked about nothing added. And now the church in Jerusalem added some things to the Gentiles' list. And now, But did they add something? We've got to wrestle with this. And that's why we went to, to Hebrews, to wrestle with it. That's why we're, we're... Because there's a separation between salvation and usefulness to God. It's a big fancy church word called sanctification. That's a journey. You see the picture in the background? You see that straight line? That little straight and narrow? That's God. That's the path God's on. You see that little coming in from the side? That's us. And we, we're going to come alongside and join God and follow God. To do that, there are changes that are made in our life. But we can't confuse those changes with saying they're requirements for salvation because they're not. But when the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart, you start seeing things a little differently. And you start desiring things a little differently. And sometimes you need a kickstart. You need a kickstart. I remember how it was put to me. The day that I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, I said, I'm good, I'm done. My name's written in the Holy Book of Life and 
Life's going to be easy now, right? <laughs> the next words out of the fellow that led me to Christ said, now we got to find you a church. I said, wait a minute. I didn't buy in for all that extra baggage stuff. I just, I'm saved. I'm good. Why did we have to find a church? What did that, what, what did Hebrews talk about? Walking alongside each other. Supporting each other, encouraging each other, lifting each Why do we need that? This is an easy walk, right? <laughs> this is an easy journey, right? No, it's not. So what did the church in Jerusalem do for the Gentile believers? Well, it brought a question up in my mind. Yeah, read that. What's that say? It's a rhetorical question. You don't have to give me answers, but think about that. What do you worship? What do you worship? I know Buster knows a few guys that worship cars. Got you got that right, you know? And they, they, they're polishing them. They're polishing them, and they got to look perfect, right? I saw an old uh, Tempest wagon this morning. It looked pretty cool on my way to church. What do you worship? Some people worship their yard, and then they they spend time just doing it. Somebody worship. Some people worship themselves, right? What does that reveal about us? What does that reveal about us. What did what did they suggest that the Gentiles believers should start focusing on? These things the Gentiles should abstain from were things that indicate what we worship. Okay? Not idol sacrifices, not blood, not women or sexual immorality, men or women. I, I know it's predominantly a male problem, but I know that, that you know, what, what, what were they trying to encourage them? Change the focus. Change the focus. Now, granted... Whether they did it or not doesn't change their salvation, but it certainly changes their usefulness to God. There's, as we sit here, each one of us can remember times in our walk where we felt close to God, like we were buddies right there together. And we know there's times where God felt a million miles away, right? And we got to come back to Him. We do that a lot. We come, we come back to God and we ask Him to rekindle the fire in our soul or, or to speak to us or to guide us or to teach us or to show us because we get caught up in our own way and we don't join Him. We kind of go off if there was another road that kind of went off to the left there. You know, I, I don't say go off to the right because we never go off to the right. We always, we always go hang a left. <laughs> we always hang a left. Um, but, but think about that process. What takes priority in my mind? If I have accepted the blood sacrifice that Christ made for me, my mind should start looking at things differently. It should start boldly lifting God up, right? And that means we've got to put some, self, some things away. Now, this is a personal internal transformation for each one of us. But if it doesn't take place, what happens? The enemy robs you of that blessing of salvation. Oh, it's there, but you don't get it. Think about the changes that need to happen in our life. Think about the outward indications we need to give that show we have made an inward decision to accept Christ. All right, if it was a crime, is there enough evidence to convict you? If being a Christian is a crime, do, do, would there people find enough evidence to convict you? I don't know. I hope so. I hope so, right? Not some days. <laughs> I need a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. <laughs> we all have those days. We all have those days. 
But we, we, that's that transformation that has to take place and spoke about in Romans of transforming our minds. We have to start looking at things differently. We have to start processing things differently. We, we have to, there, you know, salvation is one thing. Sanctification is another thing. And as we walk that journey with God, what do we see? Now, I've been on this journey since I was 30 years old. So if you can add real quick, that's 32 years. I can tell you right now that I don't see things today the way I saw them 32 years ago. Why? Because God's revelation to me is I trust Him more and I walk with Him more. I see things differently. I can do things today. I can boldly step out on faith today that 30 years ago, nah, I don't think so. You, you better get somebody else for that. But if we don't progress through that journey with God, guess what? We get stuck, and we just sit there. And we just don't experience what God has for us. What does this, what does this say over here? Joe, read that real quick. I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future. Okay, and then it goes on to say not to harm you or frustrate you. And then the next verse says, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. See, and that's what we're in. The, what they wanted the Gentiles to believe was that they needed to seek God with all their heart. They couldn't be distracted by things that didn't honor God. And we, we the same is of us. We have to look at our life and say, what is distracting me from the things that honor God? What's neat is, what's very amazing is some of your likes and some of the things you enjoy doing, God will use to attract other people to Him. And that's a good thing. But each one of us have things in our life that distract us and cause our focus to move off God. It says, The messengers went at once to Antioch where they called the general meeting of believers and delivered the letter. And there was great joy throughout the church the day they read this encouraging letter. Why do you think there was great joy throughout the church? Because they didn't have to get circumcised. Okay, because the letter didn't say, guess what, guys? All right, but there was great joy because the letter said, okay, you're good. Now let's learn how to honor God. We need to encourage new Christians, not discourage them. They're not where we are. I can't imagine somebody accepting Christ, you know, and and then immediately having 32 years of experience like I do. They're not going to act the same way. They're not going to have the same level of faith. They're not going to have... So why should I discourage them by saying, hey, you should be doing this, or you should be doing that, or you should be doing... No! Come on, let me help you. Let me show you how this walk with God goes. And let me pick you up and dust you off when you fall down. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to fix you. I'm just here to help you along this road and learn what it means to follow God. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. Are we seeing a parallel between what we read in Hebrews and what we're reading in Acts 15? Certainly. What was their purpose? to be encouraging and to strengthen their faith, to give them what they needed to boldly step out on faith and not listen to what? The people that tell them they're not good enough. The people that tell them there's no way God would save you. There's no way. I see the way you live, right? No, you, you're not saved, right? To give them the boldness to overcome the obstacles that the enemy puts in the way. And they're there. We've all faced them. It says they stayed for a while, and the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. They, with many others, taught and preached the word of the Lord there. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word 
of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Guess what? You just don't toss them out. Oh, you're good. All right, go for it. See how that works for you, right? It says, don't leave too soon, okay? Why? It's said about some denominations are dip them and drop them. Okay, what that means is they save them, they baptize them, and then they're on their own. Well, that's not the right way to do it, is it? Not according to the scripture I'm reading. And don't forget those who we have led to Christ. We we're, can get caught up in, uh, you know, okay, you're good. All right, on to the next one. You're good, you're good. And not go back. And what, what does it say in Matthew, Kevin? Matthew 28. What's it say? It says, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them all to obey all I've commanded. That's the teaching part. We get lost there sometimes, don't we? We forget about that teaching part. And we leave them on their own too soon. And we go back and say, how you doing? I'm lost, man. I feel worse than I did before. I thought I, thought I would know something by now. I thought I would get this figured out. But they don't. Why? Because we left them be. We left them be. So now we have Paul and Barnabas saying we've got to go back. And we've got to strengthen, strengthen those new believers, right? They, we've, we've got a newfound energy in the Gentile church, supported by the church in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit's moving. So what do we do? Notice what he said we're going to do. We're going to go back and visit all those churches and strengthen those Christians. Why? Because Paul and Barnabas are only two guys. Okay, they can't do it all. They can't lead the world to the Lord. They need to train up believers and get them to a place in their walk where they're able to go out and do what Paul and Barnabas do and what Silas and Judas did. The more the merrier. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Uh oh, wait a minute. We're going out on ministry. Well, I want to go this way. No, I want to go that way. Does that have any place in the church? Be careful how you answer that. Be careful how you answer that. But Paul disagreed strongly. I'm not sure what he said. But... <laughs> Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and he left. The believers entrusted him in the Lord's gracious care and then he traveled to Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Hmm. Hmm. Anybody know who John Mark is? Not you, Kevin. Do you know that John Mark wrote the first gospel? The gospel according to Mark is written by the same John Mark that deserted uh, Paul and, and uh, Barnabas. Right? Did, so, so here he was in his weakness. Do you think God could use him? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, so was this a bad thing? Well, wait a minute now. Instead of having just Paul and Barnabas out there, now we got, we've got we got Barnabas and John Mark going one way. we got Paul and Silas going the other way. Wait, we just doubled our effort, didn't we? We just doubled our effort. And sometimes we get caught up in the fact that we have to be together. But divide and conquer is a pretty, pretty good idea, isn't it? It says, sometimes it's necessary for believers to part ways, not in malice, jealousy, or anger, but in Christian love for the good of the gospel. God has uniquely qualified each of us for His task. What was Barnabas known to be? What does his name mean? Encourager. Do you think he encouraged John Mark? Oh, I can tell you he did. I think he got John Mark from where he was to a point where he wrote a gospel about the life and times of Jesus Christ. All right? 
Now, Paul in all his wonderful wisdom and all his understanding was never going to get there. <laughs> okay, John Mark wasn't going to get to where he needed to get under Paul's guidance. Because Paul's different than Barnabas. Right? Silas later regretted going with Paul. We'll talk about that, but that's a little tongue-in-cheek. Paul and, Paul and Silas got into some... <laughs> Barnabas went with him, they got into some problems. Then Silas went with him, they got into some problems. Maybe Paul's the problem here. <laughs> maybe, maybe hanging out with Paul, <laughs> he's going to, hey, we're going to see some great places <laughs> together. But, but uh, just remember, we're unique. And we can reach certain people. And sometimes we can't do that in certain environments. I, one of my best friends is a pastor down on Long Island, and, and um, he's always saying, hey, if you need a church, come. I'll help you find one. He's not, he's not, he, I don't care if it's here. And in most cases, this probably isn't the one you need to be at. He says, but I'll help you find. Well, i got plenty of churches in the neighborhood that may suit your worship style or may suit you or need to be where God's plugged you in to do what God wants you to do. Okay? So we, we need to understand that sometimes God's dividing us to conquer more space. Okay? But He also brings us together. If we refuse to allow the discomfort of change we will miss the blessing of God's will. Okay? If we don't allow God to move us from where we are, comfortable, to where He wants us to be, and, and some of you know that I was very candid when I sat with, uh, uh, with Nancy and, and Deb and Eric and Kevin and Corey, you know, about, uh, you know, I, I forget who it was. I think it was Nancy asked me. Why did I apply for this job? I says, I didn't apply for this job. Because <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Somebody else sent my resume in. And I, I says, I, I, so why am I here? Because God said, you need to move. And I'm putting you over here. Whether you're comfortable with it or not, or whether you want to do it or not. And, and that was my answer. I says, I'm here because God has made it abundantly clear to me that His hand is in this. Now, some of you may not know the, the kind of cherry on the, on the top of that deal. So, so I'm a busy guy, right? You know that. And, and this isn't about me, but it's about how God works. And I had, give, I had somebody request um, me to do something. So I had to look at my schedule and give them the two non-busy days I had in the next three months. Okay, and I did. And they picked one of them. So now I know I've only got one free Sunday in the next three months. Okay? Monday morning, I got an email from Corey. Could you come on this date to speak to the church? Guess what date that was? The free one. Absolutely, Ron. In the next three months, the only time that I have available is this time. And they didn't know it. And, I, and I'm looking at it and I'm laughing. Linda goes, what are you laughing at? I said, you'll never, figure, you'll never believe it. And I, you know, I generally don't reply the first time I read something through. But I says, I can't not. I said, certainly, I'll be there. Because <laughs> I knew the answer. I didn't have to go check my schedule. I didn't have to do any. But see, if we refuse to let God move us to where He wants us to be, to, to appreciate the plans, the hopes and plans He has for us. If we just stay right here, we miss His blessings. He miss His blessings. We miss God's blessings if we stay in the comfort of tradition. The Jews had to step out of their comfort zone and allow the Gentiles to become Christians. Right? We lose God, we miss God's blessings if we stay in the comfort of our surroundings. If we sit here and wait for them, folks, they're not coming. Oh, there may be a few 
But I can tell you this, you're going to get more leaving this place than you are sitting here waiting. We miss God's blessings if we fail to join Him, God, where He is working. I had freedom to say no. Okay, I could have said, no, thank you, I'm not available. That's the only free Sunday I have in three months. I'm going to use it for myself and I'm going to do something I want to do. I had that freedom. But, <laughs> did I really? You know how miserable that day was going to be if I chose, you know? And we miss God's blessings if we refuse to let the Holy Spirit lead us. Okay? We miss an awful lot. And, and so read between the lines here, Eric. I know he's listening. This has been a blessing to me. Okay, this, this has been a blessing to me and to my family. Okay, God, God has, has carried us through. Okay, and, and if I miss this, who knows how miserable and, and, and lost I would feel right now. And, and there's so much we miss. And so what was the motivation behind what they wanted? They wanted to to stop focusing on what you used to focus on and focus on the things that honor God. Okay? And don't, don't let change and don't let disruption and even division, don't let it fester. Just say, okay, let's go. Change has to happen. A wise man once said, <laughs> Solomon, by the way, he's a pretty wise guy. There is a time and place for everything under heaven. You can go back and you can read that in Ecclesiastes. And uh, there's a time and place for everything under heaven. And the change only may be for a season. But that's not, that's not what God asks us. He says, you need to get up and you need to go where I'm leading you. As uncomfortable as you are with it, as much as you disagree with it, Trust me, when you get through there, you will be blessed and you will recognize my hand and you will have hope in the future. We have to realize that and embrace the change God has for us as individuals, as families, as a church, as a community, and as the world. One of the most uncomfortable changes that we're going to deal with is the end of things. It's coming. Maybe not today, but we see the destruction coming, and that's uncomfortable. We don't want it to. So don't, don't be about trying to change the inevitable. Be about trying to bring as many people with you and, and giving them the hope in the future that Jeremiah talked about. Right? It is proper and necessary to join God and follow His leading, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Only then will we see God and His presence in our lives. Amen?